Welcome to This Week in South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson. It was a busy second week at the State House as Governor Henry McMaster addressed the legislature in his annual State of the State address. And the Senate Judiciary Committee passed a controversial congressional redistricting map. We talk with the League of Women Voters' Lynn Teague about the map, and the state's Mayan Schechter joins us to recap the governor's State of the State. But first, more from this week. Escort committee. This week in the State House, all eyes were on Governor Henry McMaster as he gave his fifth State of the State address, which focused on his legislative and budget priorities, but also gave a sharp rebuttal of the Biden administration. Today, South Carolina state government, however, is in the strongest fiscal condition ever. We have the largest budget surplus, the largest rainy day reserve account balance, and the lowest debt in our history. However, however, South Carolina is facing a new challenge, an unusual challenge. The dangerous, irresponsible, and sometimes unconstitutional behavior of our own federal government. President Biden seems to have been about as successful in defending his mandates in court as he has been in selling them across the country to the American people. President Biden and his liberal allies sued to force South Carolina to adopt universal mask mandates in public schools, despite clear constitutional authority to the contrary. After his address, Charleston Representative Spencer Wetmore gave the Democratic message. We need real results for South Carolina families instead of wasting valuable time on fear and division. It's time to drop the tiresome grandstanding and remember that we represent all South Carolinians, not just the less than 20 percent who vote in Republican primaries. We need to fight for the hardworking families of South Carolina. In other words, the majority of us. So tonight, I call on my colleagues to reject bitter partisanship, extremism, and the harsh rhetoric that comes with it. Lawmakers return next week to continue work on the budget, the new congressional map, and to debate medical marijuana in the Senate. Joining me now to discuss the governor's State of the State address is Mayan Schechter. She's a politics editor at the State newspaper. Mayan, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Gavin. So Mayan, you're at the State House right now, but on Wednesday night, the governor was there as well in the Joint Assembly before lawmakers kind of laying out his proposals like he does every year in the State of the State address. You've seen several of these. Tell me what stood out to you in this address this year. So I'm sure if the governor was going to give sort of a brief summary in just a few, uh, maybe a couple of words of what his executive budget, or excuse me, his uh, state of the state address, which is largely his executive budget, would be bold and transformative. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is, I think, what we saw in the budget. There are billions of dollars that are coming into South Carolina that are really already here in both state and federal um, allotments that the legislature has to spend. And so much of what the governor talked about in his state of the state was how the legislature, he believes, should spend the billions of dollars. We heard a lot of conversation about uh, education. Money is, that millions of dollars is always going to education every year. So we heard about teacher pay raises. We heard about merit pay raises for other state agency employees. We heard about millions of dollars for transportation, uh, including roads, water and sewer. Uh, we heard about broadband. We heard about millions going toward mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so much of what the governor talked about was really these big, uh, big ticket, big high price uh, policy ideas that I definitely think we'll see flow through the legislature this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all pretty easy to do to promise and to really, you know, you know, propose all these grand plans when you have billions of dollars to spend. Too, like you said, lawmakers are doing that. That's their. He he kind of gives them the idea, uh, says what his priorities are, but it's it comes down to lawmakers crafting the budget, which House lawmakers are doing right now. Right, exactly. As you know, Gavin, the governor gets to propose his spending wish list in January. Um, and uh, I think it's safe to say that maybe unlike uh, uh, some of his predecessors, the governor has a very good relationship with the legislature, which actually goes a very long way in getting some of those uh, priority wish list items um, completed. Uh, he has a particularly even better relationship, as you know, with the House. That's where the budget starts. Uh, so it's very likely, as I mentioned, and as you said, that we'll see some of those priorities, probably many of those priorities, flow through uh, the budget that will go through the House Ways and Means Committee. And Mayan, it's an election year, uh, not just for House members, but also for the governor himself. 
uh, running for a second term. He has no Republican challengers. We saw uh, that potential challenger John Warren drop out, say he was not going to run against the governor. Uh, there are two Democrats vying for the nomination to challenge him in November. But, you know, in election year, we the governor, during these speeches, it kind of becomes like a pseudo-campaign speech as well. You know, you have statewide broadcast coverage, radio, TV all across the state uh, to kind of lay out these your agenda and talk about how great things have been. And, and, you know, rightfully so, there have been a lot of accomplishments. Things are looking up for our state. Economy is great. Uh, unemployment's very low. But when it comes down to some other things, you know, he didn't he didn't mince his word there too. His words when he was trying to make some jabs, uh, you know, at the Democrats both nationally and locally, kind of tells what you heard in some of the more partisan parts of this speech. Right. So just because the governor may not have a high profile challenger uh, in the primary, it's still a handful of months before the primary. So he is very much still on a primary politicking kind of schedule. I did not count the number of times that he said Joe Biden's name last night in his speech. Mm -hmm. I think I saw a tweet that it may have been around seven or eight, uh, but he certainly used uh, his state of the state address, his fifth state of the state address, to go after the Biden administration, particularly when it came down to the uh, COVID-19 mandates that the Biden administration had hoped uh, the Supreme Court would not reject, but which they did, uh, especially mm -hmm. for those employers with 100 or more employees. Yeah, that was a big, uh, big accomplishment there too, a big victory. Yeah, no, we heard a lot of stuff talking about, uh, you know, jabbing at some Democratic-run states, also hearing about, you know, uh, how the Biden administration was paying people to stay home during the pandemic, uh, which we all know was because of a pandemic, but also that money flowing into our coffers right now. No one's complaining about that. So it's interesting to see that, and we have seen the continuous battle back and forth between the administration and getting that accomplishment with the Supreme Court. But we also saw some national rhetoric around education, which we know Republicans are really focusing on, especially after the victory in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin, the Republican there, really cashing in on that, you know, critical race here, which we didn't hear about in this speech, but we did hear some some discussion about you know parents getting more involved, being uh, correct when it comes to the education process. Uh, tell us about what he wants to see done, though, with education funding, kind of overhauling this. Is that easier said than done? It seems like one of the bigger issues uh, that comes with education these days. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's like tax reform or ethics reform, but it is definitely going to be a heavy lift. I mean, it's interesting to me, you know, just a few short years ago, I remember the uh, Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office putting together um, some kind of new funding formula for education. And then here we are revisiting the exact same thing because they weren't able to get it over the finish line last year. It's not a sexy topic. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be a lot for the legislature to digest. Um, but that's certainly one of the big overhauls that I think the uh, McMaster uh, administration and the governor, as well as his staff and uh, state house leaders, especially those who are uh, dealing with the budget and education, want to see at least some time fixed in their lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. Another uh, key portion of his executive budget includes uh, pay raises for teachers around $2,000. Um, of course, teachers do not feel that that is enough especially when you consider the last couple of years uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic when uh, the teacher shortage continued to skyrocket. I think I heard a number the other day over a thousand classrooms did not have full-time teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, a lot of students um, are, are and they're, excuse me, a lot of school districts are still bouncing between doing kind of hybrid, being in class, out of class. So teachers and uh, those that represent them are definitely lobbying for, for higher um, pay raises. Yeah, and that's something, too, a lot of parents getting involved now with education, of course, because they have been at home with their their children who have been doing, you know, virtual schooling and also, you know, maybe staying home because they're sick, things like that over the past two years. So a lot more focus on education will be interesting to see what does make it across the finish line uh, in the next few months here. But, Mayan, again, something you mentioned was just the governor proposing, again, a 1% pay, 1%, uh, sorry, tax cut over five years for all tax brackets. Uh, any any chance we might see some movement on this? Because he has been talking about it for years now. There's so much money coming to the state, so it's clear that maybe there is room to maybe make a cut like this? Definitely. I think there is uh, uh, definitely some movement, both in the House and the Senate. And again, as you mentioned, this is a re-election year, especially not only for the governor, but for the House as well. Um, so tax cuts will be a, a very sort of popular thing that lawmakers can go back home to their constituents and tell them that they did before their re-election. I definitely think that there is an appetite in both chambers to do something about the income tax rate. But yesterday I spoke to a state senator, uh, Sean Bennett, who, as you know, is kind of like the tax guy around the legislature. And while he was very supportive of, of cutting the income tax uh, top rate from 7 to 6 percent, 
he said there is so much more work that needs to be done. If, if South Carolina is really going to solve its tax problems, it's got to tackle property taxes. It's got to tackle sales taxes. And there's a lot of uncertainty whether that actually happens uh, in, in anybody's short careers or, or lifetimes here in the legislature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when you're in the second year of a two-year session and a lot of things are coming down to the deadline in May. So we'll see where that goes. But uh, one big successful initiative that we did see the governor uh, put forward last year was this uh, workforce scholarship program with the technical colleges across the state to really get people trained up, with, you know, if they're in between jobs, if they're looking for work, to get them certified in high demand jobs, whether that's, you know, nursing assistant, truck drivers, just a, a, an array of jobs that are uh, very much in demand. And we've heard him uh, wanting to dedicate about $120 million to this program and again, to really give people, you know, scholarships to get in there and get trained up and get a new job and, and change their life, essentially. Uh, talk about that proposal and maybe some of these other workforce development proposals, because we've been hearing from lawmakers who are worried about, you know, education and how that flows into our workforce pipeline, especially when you have all these big businesses relocating to the state. Are you going to have enough people to work for these businesses? That's the big question right now. Right. Well, it's sort of two pronged, right? Um, we've seen a, a college tuition at four-year colleges skyrocket, which is why the legislature, with the governor's backing, have tried very hard to sort of settle, settle and, and level college tuition. And one of the things we've seen over the years as they've pushed that has also been to get more people into the technical college system. Um, it's obviously cheaper, it's still great education, and like you said, they're building a pipeline to these businesses. So not only does it solve the issue of college tuition, it's also solving the issue of the labor shortage that South Carolina is experiencing, that the nation is experiencing, mm -hmm. by having students go through the technical college pipeline and be able to enter into a workforce. I mean, that's an automatic job. Yep. And a lot of those jobs are, are pretty well-paying, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a, it's, it is a policy proposal that is being done, I, I think, nationwide, because people are re understanding the issues of skyrocketing college tuition and the labor shortage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also saw him talk about, you know, uh, boosting some money for uh, nursing schools to help get them to get more nurses in the pipeline. Also, like you said earlier, teacher pay raises, law, inform law enforcement pay raises, similar things like that to really kind of help address a lot of these workforce issues. But Maya, uh, moving on towards infrastructure, you know, you're talking about colleges not like not having to raise tuition this year because of the tuition freeze that's been proposed again. But there's hundreds of millions of dollars of deferred maintenance. Some of that's actually being addressed in this budget too. But talk about some other infrastructure that we're seeing. You know, big money, more than a billion dollars for roads and bridges. Something I'm sure SCDOT Secretary Christy Hall is very excited to see, especially because we continually have a shortfall, even though we have raised the gas tax and we're going to be fully funded next year. Yeah, even with that, there's still a shortfall every year when it comes to roads and bridges and infrastructure. Uh, is this budget going to fix all that? You know, it'll remain to be seen, but there is a there is billions of dollars that will be flowing to uh, major infrastructure needs, like you mentioned, roads. And that's both on the state level and also on the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, it should really kickstart some of the big highway projects that I'm sure DOT has been really gunning to start, uh, um, which is included in their 10-year plan. Um, beyond that, we're obviously, as you mentioned, the governor is spending a lot of money uh, looking at just other infrastructure things, water and sewer, which have been long neglected needs in a lot of areas of the state, particularly in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of this maintenance has pretty been, it's been long deferred. It's been pushed down the line because the state just hasn't had uh, the, uh, I guess, economic windfall, right, to be able to pay for these things. Now, with the uh, surge of, of federal dollars and with the um, incredibly great economic turn that the state has had in getting those state dollars, uh, I definitely think we'll probably be seeing a lot more orange cones on the roads. And I feel like already I've seen a lot more orange cones on the roads in the last few weeks. <laughs> yeah, watch out for Malfunction Junction. They already broke ground in November. Oh, yeah. But Maya, I'm really quick. You have two minutes left and I have two questions for you. I want to ask you about what we didn't hear in the governor's speech, and that was hate crimes and medical marijuana, both of which are on the Senate calendar. Tell us about that and what, what's going on with those bills. Yeah, so as you mentioned, hate crimes passed the House. Um, it has yet to pass the Senate, and that is because there are several names. Um, several lawmakers who are objecting to, to the legislation. Honestly, it's very unclear where that bill goes. Um, there was obviously a huge momentum, a lot of push in the last year, but that kind of has hit a standstill. And frankly, I'm sure like you, I have not heard a lot of legislators talk about it. Mm -hmm. Medical marijuana is entirely different. Um, that bill is set to go on special order if uh, Senator Tom Davis has his wish. Uh, Senate Majority uh, Shane Massey said this bill will get a debate, which is 
in and of itself huge because mm-hmm. the bill, as you know, has not been debated on the floor uh, ever, at least in, not that I can recall. Um, so this is a huge deal. Um, it remains to be seen whether the Senate has enough votes to do it. There is mm-hmm. um, at least one name that I still know of that is has objected to the legislation, but it seems that this bill will, will at some point get a debate. Yep. What its future looks like, we don't know. Yep. And then, Mayan, really quick with uh, 30 seconds left, I want to ask you about the Democratic response. We heard from Spencer Wetmore from Charleston. It's just what stood out to you really quickly from that response. Well, I, I think what stood out the most is sort of like it kind of embodied the way that Spencer Wetmore entered the legislature in the first place. Uh, she is a Charleston Democrat who won a seat that was long held by Republicans. She is the really only Democratic success story in 2020 uh, because Republicans were able to flip five seats. So really what stood out from her speech was kind of an embodiment of her uh, uh, running in the first place. Um, it was pretty nonpartisan. Uh, she was very complimentary of the governor. She talked about you know settling down the, the political rhetoric. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, this is a primary election year and this election year in general. So <laughs> I don't know how long that will last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be catching up with you throughout the session and the year. Thanks, Mayan Schechter. She is the politics editor at the State Newspaper. Thanks so much, Gavin. And joining me now to discuss congressional redistricting is Lynn Teague. She's the vice president of Issues in Action with the League of Women Voters of South Carolina. Lynn, welcome back. It's always great to see you. Thank you for having me here. Well, Lynn, since we last spoke on this show, we've seen the House and Senate district maps be approved by their chambers and by the governor. Uh, Now all eyes are on the congressional maps. Uh, One has been approved by the House. One was just approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee this week. Uh, Tell us about what the House approved, and that's now over in the Senate, of course, and then what we're seeing coming out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Sure. Um, Actually, what's come out of the House and what Senate Judiciary forwarded to the floor yesterday are uh, fairly similar maps. Mm -hmm. And uh, the League of Women Voters, we're not fans of either one. Uh, (laughs) Why not? What's what's wrong wrong with them, in your opinion? Well, we believe that um, they treat uh, the Low Country very badly. They treat Richland County very badly. Um, There is... uh, Uh, a split in Richland County caused by continuing sending uh, Congressional District 2 uh, sort of ambling across northern Richland County Mm -hmm. for really no good reason. Um, Richland can easily be kept whole. The League of Women Voters submitted our own map, and in that map, uh, Richland is whole. In Senate Amendment 2, which Senator Harpulian introduced in committee, um, that map, too, keeps Richland whole. Uh, It is not hard to keep Richland whole. It is also not hard to keep Charleston whole. Mm -hmm. Now, we've always known that for the congressional map, for all of the maps, what's happening on the low country is especially um, difficult because that's where the biggest population changes happen. We've seen uh, massive population growth along the coast, especially in Ori, but also in Charleston and that area. Uh, especially in the satellite cities and suburbs around Charleston, and then running down to Hilton Head and so forth. Um, At the same time, we've seen a reduced population in the I-95 corridor, basically, in that inland area between the foothills and the the coast. Um, And and the change has been uh, more or less balanced. So we knew that congressional districts one and six were going to be doing some Mm trade-offs. And that six would have to expand to have enough population and one would have to contract. Now, if you assume that we have to live with what we've had before, (laughs) uh, that constrains you to some degree. But the league tried to not create as radical a change as we see, for example, in uh, Senate Amendment 2. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have changes, but they're not that radical. But our map still manages to keep Richland whole, does not um, cut across the predominantly black neighborhoods of northwestern Richland County, which is uh, to us disturbing in some versions of the maps, Um, does not uh, break up the Charleston area. And uh, over and over, since hearings began for the Senate in August, I think, People from that area have said, we don't want to be so fragmented. Mm -hmm. But yet, what the Senate has now put forward uh, puts the entire Charleston Peninsula 
into CD6 with Columbia. Hmm. 100 miles away. Well, <laughs> yeah, they're getting them out of the way. They're getting the Charleston Peninsula out of the way. And to be blunt, they're getting a lot of black voters in North Charleston and adjacent areas out of the way. And as a consequence, CD1, as drawn in both the House plan and the plan advanced by Senate Judiciary, has a black population considerably lower than the general area, than the county. Um, Charleston County, Berkeley County, of course, have um, black populations considerably over 20 percent, and we're seeing that cut back to 17 percent. Um, well, then what's the justification for these maps at this point? I mean, what, what are people saying? Why can't they make your maps or, you know, other maps that maybe keep these communities together, keep these guidelines intact? What are they saying that they, they can't get around it, essentially? Well, uh, first of all, they've said, well, there are people from Beaufort who want to be in CD1, and it's hard to draw Beaufort into CD1 and keep Charleston whole and so forth. However, there have been, overall, since August, there have been many more people who've said, keep Charleston whole. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a bigger argument there, I think. You really can't argue that Mount Pleasant should be in the same congressional district with Beaufort, and the Charleston Peninsula should mm -hmm. be eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, CD1 has been competitive. Yeah. It's flipped back and forth. And that is a consequence of really the, the breakdown of population in that area, which is diverse. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it, it isn't diverse in the odd sense. It's sometimes you, sometimes you see majority minority places called diverse. No, that's homogenous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Charleston area and its satellite cities and suburbs are an economic hole, a social hole, and they are genuinely diverse. Mm -hmm. racially, socially, but they're very tied economically. We're seeing maps in which parts of the Charleston port are separated from other parts of the Charleston port. Mm -hmm. How does that make sense? Um, how does hopping from Mount Pleasant to James Island by water make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's legal. You can be contiguous by water. You have to have that because otherwise, how would you give a district to Edisto Island mm -hmm. or uh, contiguous by water is legitimate, but you don't usually use it to skip over an entire peninsula. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and we hear the argument that, well, um, urban areas, counties are split elsewhere. Again, there's no good reason to split Richland. Our map shows that. Senate Amendment 2 shows that. Um, so this, Greenville, it's hard, yeah. it's hard to draw without splitting, but... I was going to say, is this just blatant gerrymandering at this point, or is it just really everyone protecting it's their own interests? Yeah. I mean, when you yeah, see that, something like that's this. that's the word we're coming to here. Yeah. It's, it's designer district to uh, achieve an end, and um, that that's what we're looking at. Now, there are plenty of rationales, but the League map and Senate Amendment 1, I mean, Senate Amendment 2, which mm -hmm. is now not in consideration unless Harpalian brings it up again on the floor, both are truer to the basic requirements mm -hmm. of uh, the legislative criteria than what we're looking at uh, moving forward. So, Lynn, right now we're taping this Thursday morning. Uh, the Senate will come in today. Uh, they, they might get onto this, this map at some point today, but likely the big debate will be next week, obviously. Um, where do you see that debate going? Um, do we expect to see any amendments being proposed, like you're mentioning? Or, I mean, just do you think it's going to be a, a knockdown, drag out fight? Because in the House, it was pretty somewhat quick, but they have different rules in the Senate. So, what can we expect to see over there? I, we do expect to see amendments offered on the floor in the Senate. Um, we know that Senator Harpillion reserved the right to reintroduce Senate Amendment 2 when he did not insist on debating it in full judiciary yesterday. Um, we also expect. Uh, that, that we may see a variant of the League of Women Voters map reappear. Um, but we, we don't know. Uh, but it's a good map, and, and there is interest in it. So that, that may also be uh, something we can see again. You know, and, and if people want to see our testimony on this and maps and so forth, um, there is material up at the redistricting.scsenate.gov and schouse.gov websites. But there's a lot of material at our league website. Gotcha. Yeah, there's uh, plenty of... LWVSC.org. 
Mm -hmm. But Lynn, with about a minute left, I want to ask you, you know, obviously the debate's next week, but we're getting really close to the filing deadline for these congressional races. We're talking about March. We're not far away. And then potential lawsuits are already lawsuits filed. Uh, how, how is this all going to work out in your opinion or how we've seen it work out before? Will we see primaries get pushed back? Will we see filing get pushed back? What do you expect in less than a minute? I expect to see filing and primaries get pushed back. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that for sure but that is my expectation. We know that there is already litigation on the House map. Now, the Senate map for the Senate was not a terrible map. It was not a bad map. And nobody so far has filed objections. There are some concerns the League had about it, but basically an okay map. Mm -hmm. The House map is not. And so that has already been um, put into litigation by the ACLU and the NAACP. Uh, and if the congressional map goes through as proposed in Senate Amendment 1 or the map the House adopted, I would fully expect those to be in litigation as well. Mm -hmm. And normally this, this does push back filing, push back primaries. The primaries could be as late as sometime in August. Oh, wow. Instead of June, a lot to watch for. We'll be watching with you there, Lynn, especially next week when that bill comes up for debate in the Senate. And that's Lynn right. Teague. She's the Vice President of Issue in Ac Issues in Action with the League of Women Voters of South Carolina. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. To stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host twice a week that you can find on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.